Right, OK, good morning, everybody. So we're kicking off a bit late because we had quite a few stragglers coming from maths. So let's get going. This lecture, oh, by the way, in the future, I'm going to leave a half the notes there and half the notes there. And I only ever give you one handout per lecture. There's never two handouts. So if you, come in, you can come in that door and get the notes and in that door, and that should make it a bit easier to get in the room. Right, so this lecture um, is called... Uh, computer programming with MATLAB. So this is lecture four. You've been here a month so far. It doesn't seem like that. And it's called computer hardware, screen output, strings, and keyboard input. So at this stage, you should actually have enough knowledge to do all the coursework um, for coursework one anyway. So nothing in this lecture is related to coursework one. Having said that, what I'm going to cover today um, needs you to get your head round a bit. So I suggest in the examples class, you spend about an hour doing the worksheet for this lecture, because it will just help you um, embed it in your memory. Right, so here's an overview of today's lecture. We are going to cover, it's very hard looking up there, <coughs> computer fundamentals. So um, I'm going to teach you a little bit about actual computer hardware. And you're going to have to know this um, what, as soon as you start to progress in writing programs anymore. So you can't really tell the computer what to do unless you understand a little bit about what's going on in the background. I'm going to talk about different types of computers you might meet in industry. I'm going to talk about ASCII code and why you guys need to know about that. And then I'm going to talk about writing to the screen, reading from the keyboard, and I'm going to talk a little bit about something called strings. So firstly, I thought I'd kick off and tell you what I like about MATLAB. So what I like about MATLAB is it's quite good at handling arrays, and it's very easy for you guys as engineers to handle lots of data in big arrays. I also like the fact it's good with complex numbers. Um, it's quite simple to program. It sort of hits that sweet spot for engineering students that it's sort of quite quick to program, it's good at all the things that you need to do in engineering, and it also produces really beautiful graphs. So it really is sort of the optimum language to teach you guys um, in your first year, and it's very useful even in, in, even in industry. And it's generally very good for you guys. Now, what I don't like about MATLAB, as some of you found out, it's not free like other computer languages. But having said that, you can get a license for a student license for about 30 quid, and the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Uh, it's not as quick as other computing languages, so if you want to write really, really fast code, MATLAB's not your best choice. But the main thing, or the main point of me putting up these slides to tell you what I don't like about MATLAB, is that it gives you this interface here, this fancy interface. And you sort of, when you look at that interface, it makes you think, oh, it's just a package. It's just like Creo, or it's like Excel, and I'm just learning a package. Well, you're not learning a package. What I'm teaching you is something far more fundamental than just a package. This isn't a package. I'm teaching you, with this lecture, how to actually control every device in the computer. I'm telling you how to control the speakers, how to control the hard disk, how to control the disk drive. I'm teaching you how to actually gain control over the hardware. And this is what you do with MATLAB. With Creo, you, you, can't, you can't take control of the computer. You can't tell the computer what you want it to do. It's all very vague. You know, you might... It's, yeah, so... The, the, this is, so I don't like the fact it, it shows it, you, you can mis mistake it for a package, which isn't. It's about programming. Um, <clears throat> now, to really use the power of the computer or to really program a computer, you need to know a little bit about computer hardware. Now, I'm not talking lots. I'm not talking to the same level as an electronic engineer. But I want you just to have like a general appreciation for what's going on in that box when you, tell it to pro when you try and program it. And there's some very sort of basic rules that you should probably know about um, before, well, once you start to do, write more complex programs. And this will help you write more, uh, so quicker programs, more efficient programs, and generally make your life easier if you just know a little bit about the hardware. So what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about what's on the inside of a typical PC. So we're going to sort of disassemble a PC, and we're going to look at all the bits of it. I'm going to tell you roughly what they do, uh, just, enough, just, just enough to give you an idea of what's, what it's all, all about. And the point about this is we're disassembling a PC because it's big. PCs are like this big, and I can pull the bits out, and I hand them around the class, and you can look at it. But the innards of a PC are, in principle, identical to any computer you might, you might meet. So this gentleman's graphics calculator here, it's got the same components in it as a PC. They're just a bit less powerful. You know, so e even you know, video cameras, every everything, the computer architecture is the same. So what I'm teaching here is basically um, useful to know if you're programming any device in industry. How many of you built your own PC at home? 
Okay, good, good, good. We're going to find this quite easy. Right, so this is what is in a PC in general. So you've got a processor, and this is super simplified, by the way. You've got a bit of memory, so this is main memory. You've got a hard disk, and you've got some input and output devices, and connecting it all together, you've got something called a bus. Okay? So let's have a look at the main memory to start with. So this is what main memory looks like. It looks like, so each one of those there is a, is a memory chip, is a RAM chip, and it can, each one of those can store maybe, I don't know, 100 megabytes of information, and that stick's probably got a gigabyte on it. So here, in my collection, somewhere, there we go, I've got a memory stick. So just hand this around the class. So just pa pass this all the way around the class. So I'll start there and just w make, it, make its way back. So that, that's a memory chip you can have a look at. Now, the thing about these memory chips is they're incredibly fast. They are super fast. You can get information out of that memory chip in about a nanosecond. That is incredibly fast. Um, they're also quite expensive. So per megabyte, the memory in that memory, memory stick is pretty expensive. So if you buy a new PC, you might have 2 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes of memory like that. Because it's so fast, it's so expensive. Okay? So you're paying a premium for that speed. And in this main memory, you store, basically, the program that's currently running. So when you write a script, that is stored in that memory there. When you define a variable, when you define an array, all that is stored in this chip there. And the thing about this memory is, although it's really fast, it can only remember things whilst it's got power. So when you, when you turn the computer off, everything in this chip just disappears. It forgets it immediately. Um, and that's why, you know, when you switch the computer off, you've got to you know, boot it again and load all the programs from scratch. Uh, yeah, so that's the main memory. So now let's look at the hard disk. So I've got, I've got a hard disk here that I'll be passing around. Do, do keep passing around that memory. So this thing, this hard disk, can store a load of information, absolute shed load. So I think this one's an old one, but you can very easily buy today a two terabyte disk. So that's like a thousand times bigger. So it's got a thousand times more storage than your main memory. So this thing can store huge quantities of, 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 of data. But um, it's incredibly slow. This thing takes about uh, a millisecond to access data. Okay, So that's about a million times slower than your main memory. So this thing, when you pull data off the hard disk, it's going to be incredibly <coughs> slow. And in fact, what's interesting is you think, oh, computers are getting better all the time. But if you look at the, the access speeds of this modern hard disk and compare it to the first hard disk made, which was about 20, 20 megabytes big in about 1960, the access speeds are actually about the same. It's not getting faster. And the reason it's not getting faster is because it's a mechanical device. So if we, uh, if we, if we open this up, what we see, oh, it's bent. Oh, never mind. <laughs> what we see if we open this up is, is basically we see a, a spinny disk. So this disk rotates like that. And we've got this arm here. So you can think of this hard disk a bit like a record player. So what happens is this disk is always rotating really fast. And when you want to access a file, so you basically move this head, this read-write head, to the position where the file is. So here we've got the file written in basically a stripe so all the data is written in like a stripe around this disk. So this disk is spinning like that. The read-write head is over this file 3. The file 3 rotates under the head, and then it's read off into your computer's memory. Now, this is a really slow bit. If we now want to read file 1, what's got to happen is this head has got to move over here. So that, that, that's one like time step. That takes about a millisecond. And then we've got to wait for this file 1 to rotate all the way around here and come back under the head, and then you can read it. So it's like a mechanical system. There's a mechanical delay, and that's why hard disks are so slow compared to this main memory. But the reason we still use them is because is they're so cheap to store data on. They're like really, really cheap. So here's this. I'll start it off the other, the other end. So there you go. You're going to have to do a bit of walking to give it to your mate. So that's coming around there. Yeah, so this is a top programming tip. This is one of the main takeaways from this, ne this next le this section. If your program is, is running slowly, it is almost certainly writing too much data to the hard disk. That is, that's a killer on any computer. If you write to the hard disk, your program is going to be so slow. So what people do is they, for example, save all the data in main memory and then dump it to the hard disk right at the end. So try and avoid hard disk access. 
So that's a top tip from me. So now let's look at the processor. So let's find the processor. Have I got it? Here we go. Here's the processor. So it's just a little chip. And this chip is the thing that does the math. So when you actually type into MATLAB, 1 plus 2 times 3 plus 4 over 7, this is the thing that does the mathematics. Um, all mathematical operations are done on here. And, yeah, the speed of this is measured in operations per second. And, and, and your program also executes on this. So this will be the thing that's reading one line, next line, next line, next line, next line. This is the intelligent bit. And these are often the most expensive part of any computer. So you can start passing that around. Right. Next thing um, that we want to talk about is the bus. The bus is a set of wires that basically join. It's like an information superhighway that join all these components together. And it is literally a set of wires. And if you know, the processor wants information from the hard disk, it pulls it along the set of wires. And here, I've got a, a motherboard. And if you look on the motherboard, you can see there's like lots of brown wires if you look really closely. And that's literally the wires that are connecting all these components together. Um, yeah, I think I've said that. So I think you can start off there. Pop, pop, send that round. And that's labelled, by the way, to show you where the different components go. Now then, this is the point I really want to make. So here's your processor, and here's like the internet. So we've got the processor, the main memory, the hard disk, and the internet. So if you think about like physical distance from your processor, the further you get from your processor, generally speaking, the slower it is to access information. So if, you, if you're pulling stuff off the internet, it's going to be like tortoise slow. Um, whereas if you're pulling information off your main memory, it's going to be like sprint, sprinter quick. Okay? So when you're trying to make a fast program, make sure all your information is very close to your processor. So basically in the memory, not on the hard disk, and definitely not on the internet. And generally speaking, the cost of the storage as you go in this direction gets bigger. So like, it's more expensive per megabyte to have data in RAM than it is to have it on Google Drive. So that's quite an important thing to remember. Right, so now, um, any questions about that? No? OK. Right, so now I want to tell you about different types of computers you might meet, or you will meet, in your engineering career. And there's various types of computers I wish to talk about. So we covered, basically, desktop computers. And this, 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 scale, this graph here is a, is a graph I've made up. And it's on a log scale. And 1 means basically the power, the, power of, um, the power of a desktop PC. So you know, my laptop there, or your, your PC or something, has a power of about 1. And then right down here, the power of, sort of 0 0.001 is the coffee maker. And then right up here, on the, on the scale of, sort of 10,000, is the supercomputer. So I'm sort of trying to show you how powerful these devices are. And there's this class of computer called embedded computers. And an embedded computer is probably the type of computer you're going to be programming in industry. So at the moment, we're programming, programming PCs because they're very easy to use, and they're there. But realistically, in industry, you're not going to be programming PCs. You're going to be programming embedded systems. And an embedded computer is basically um, a computer that's embedded in something to make it smart. So for example, this, this robot here has got a couple of computers embedded in him. And were I to turn him on, he would start doing things. I'm not going to because he's a pain and takes a lot of time to turn off. Um, but this is an example of an embedded system. Somebody's embedded computers in this thing to make it smart. Um, so, you know, <coughs> I, I saw an advert in, in John Lewis for a, a, uh, an internet-connected uh, kettle. So that somebody's embedded the process in that kettle to join the internet so you can make it go on from bed with, with your smartphone. Other examples of embedded devices might be a computer embedded in your 3D printer to make it smart, or a computer embedded in this aircraft to make it navigate. So I'm just going to go through a few different types of these things you might meet in industry. So I've talked about him. Uh, a very common type of embedded computer is, um, I'm just going to rip this off, is, uh, is, is called the computer on a chip. So this is basically, this whole thing is a computer. And in this single chip here, there is all, all of these things basically integrated. So it won't have a hard disk, it'll have some little bit of memory. But it's called a computer on a chip. And these things are basically cheap. So this is your Raspberry Pi, your Arduino. So if you have like a very cheap product, you can embed in it 
this computer on a chip, and you can make it smart, so you can pass that round. Okay. Now, um, I talked about the Wi-Fi kettle that I, I quite wanted, and this is all part of the Internet of Things. Have you, who's heard about the Internet of Things? Yeah? So the idea is, basically, in a few years, or even now, everything's going to be connected. And in fact, um, lots of things are connected already. For example, that, that camera there um, on the lectern is, is probably an internet-connected camera. So that's like a camera that's been made smart and is on the internet. Um, and other things that are smart, maybe, for example, that, that PIR there, um, that light sensor, that might be on the internet. I, I, I don't know. So the idea is, basically, your fridge um, will know in the future uh, when it's empty and will order more food from you from Amazon, and it will come automatically. And there's lots of companies trying to vie to get their chips into the Internet of Things. And one of them is Intel. And Intel has made this sort of computer board, which is basically a, quite a clever computer on a, sm on a small board. And again, it's got integrated into it all of these components, but it's sort of been made pretty small. And here we've got like an Ethernet port, a bit of DC power, uh, there's the processor, a bit of memory, um, a bit of actually SD card for your storage instead of the hard disk. So they're all trying to sell these things to put in. So Intel's trying to sell these things to put in fridges and, and what have you. So this is the type of thing you could very well be programming in a few years. And here, I have one. Now then, I'm going to hand this round. Actually, I'm going to put it in this packet. I'm not going to put it in this packet. Right. Mm. I'm actually not going to hand this round because it's not got a protective packet on it. This still works and it's worth about 200 quid. Um, and if you touch it with your fingers, um, you can quite easily shock it with static electricity. So it's here. You have a look at it on the way out. I won't hand it round because uh, one of the academics in electrical will be very cross with me. Okay. So the other type of... I think this is the final, this is the final type of embedded system you might meet. This thing is called a DSP. This is called a Digital Signal Processor. And the thing about this computer is it's very, very good at handling live data. So it will handle multiple streams of, of sensor data in real time. And the, where, where these things are used, are, for example, in your Jaguar sports car, the engine's going to have uh, temperature, air pressure, fuel mixture. All these sensors are going to be feeding live data into something like this, uh, this computer. And it's going to have to adjust the fuel mixture, not like within a second, but within sort of microseconds. So the thing about these is they're very good at taking in lots of information streams and then doing something. And you'll meet these when you start to program things like engines. They're called digital signal processors because they um, are good at processing signals. Um, and here's one going around. And this one's actually been set up to, uh, pr to process audio. So it's actually got an audio jack in and audio jack out. So this thing is from electrical engineering. So where shall I start that? I'll go to the middle. Actually, I'll start there. There you go. <laughs> Right, so we've done desktop computers, we've done embedded computers. The last thing I want to talk to you about is supercomputers. Now, you might think, oh, physicists use those. What do engineers use those for? Well, very quickly, um, your problems get too big to solve on your single, com on your single compu desktop computer. So, for example, when you're just designing rockets or looking at airflow over wings, very, very big computational problems you very quickly cannot do this on your desktop computer. And it's very common to say, oh, I can't do it on my desktop computer. I'll spin up 100 CPUs on this, on this cluster, and it can do the work in an hour. And I very often, in, in my research, run, run clusters and spin up 100 or so CPUs, you know, just, just for a night, just to solve my problem. So when you start tackling serious problems in industry, you'll very quickly start having to use these things to solve very, very difficult physical problems. Uh, Last year, we had some guy come to talk to us about supercomputers. I'll, tr from, I'll try and get somebody from industry this, this year, but I'm not making a promise. Right. So any question about computers in general before we move on? No? Nope. Okay. Good. Right. So I'm now going to teach you the final thing, the final fundamental thing about, uh, about computers today. And it's called ASCII code. Right. Did you know that no matter what computer you have, whether it's my smartphone, uh, you know, that, that CCTV camera, the computer there, all text is transmitted and stored using a code called ASCII code. So whenever you write like hello, all computers use the same code to store that word hello. And what they do is they assign a number between 0 
and 255 to every single character in the English alphabet. For example, if a computer wants to store an A, it doesn't store A, it stores 97. If a computer wants to store a big A, it stores 65. So notice little a and big A have different numbers. And if you want to store a little b, it's 98. And you can see these on, on character mapping windows. So here is the codes from 0 to 127. So you can see, um, for example, here's big A is 66, big B, 67, big C, 68, uh, little a, uh, 90, 98, little b, 99. Other interesting things, space has got its own character, which is 32. What else do we have? Semicolon, 48. So you can see all the characters of the English, of the English alphabet are basically stored in this code. And this code's really old. I think it was like 1960s or maybe earlier that um, people decided computers have to talk to each other. I think it was when sort of te automatic telegraph machines were being invented. I'm not sure. But anyway, these guys in the US came up with this code, and basically the whole world uses it. Like that all computers use this code. So this is quite fundamental to know. Now, so what we can do is we can represent any text using this magic code. Oh, by the way, tip, I will never ask you to remember this in an exam, OK? <laughs> That's the only thing in an exam I will, I will never test you. I promise I'll never test you. I'll never, do ne never remember this. Don't try and memorize that, please. That is not, not what I want. So if we wanted to store my name, Dr. McKenzie, in, um, we could store this as the number 68 for big D, the number 114 for little r, 46 for the full stop, 32 for space, 77 for the M, and you get the idea. So every letter um, has got this number associated with it. You might be like, well, brilliant. Why is he telling me about that? That sounds really boring. Well, it's not, because whenever you want to talk to a computer, you will have to talk to it in ASCII code. So, for example, if you have this robot here doing things, taking things in and out of a furnace, and you want to control it, it won't expect English characters. It will expect ASCII code, OK? So when you want to, for example, tell it to turn on, so power on, you can't just send it power on. You've got to send it 80, 111, 119, 101, uh, 114, 79, 110, which is the, the ASCII code for power on. So whenever you want to talk to a device in your project, you're going to be sending ASCII code. You're not going to be sending it text. So first MATLAB command of the day, if you want to do this sort of ASCII code in MATLAB, you, we know how to define 1D arrays. So we just define a 1D array containing the ASCII code we want. And if we want to convert this to like normal text, we just go char, which is a new, like, a new term we've just learned, char for character, brackets, name of the array, and it'll print out uh, the actual text that, that, that is stored in this ASCII code. Right. So I thought I'd wake you up now. I would like you... So we, I would like you to figure out, so these, these numbers here are going to be sent to this robot. And this robot's going to do something. So what I'd like you to do is use this ASCII, ASCII table on the back of your notes to convert this into English and find out what the robot will do. And for the first, uh, like, 10, maybe 20 people, there's some pick and mix. So there's a prize. See how quickly you can do it. Oh, and the zero is a gap between commands, by the way. Is that not motivating enough? Pick a mix. <laughs> You're doing it in your head. How are we doing? There's probably an app to do this, by the way, too. <laughs> Have we got it yet? Huh? It might be, I can't remember. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> How are we doing? Who's got... Oh! Are you right in the middle? That's quite frustrating. No, don't shout it. Don't shout it. Nobody shout the answer. Show... Uh, I've got to get through here somehow. Show me the sheet. <laughs> I'll come round there. Anybody else got the answer? Yeah, show it to me. Yep. 
Only one. There we go. Any others? No, you got to write it. Go on, what is it? <laughs> Go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's all right. Okay, I'll come over there. Let's see what you got. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay. Any answers over here? How you doing? Let's see. Yeah, very good. We've got to get going now, so. How you doing? Yeah, very good. Where was the first person? All oh, right. Uh, right, I've got to get going now, so maybe you can be trusted to share the background. <laughs> right, okay, so that was a little bit of fun. So you've now got an idea of, um, so you can just pass that bag around, don't eat them all yourself, you'll have a sugar high. Um, all right, all right, so. Okay, guys, guys, all right, can I have your attention? Okay, super. So I've now got 15 minutes left, and we're just going to rattle through the rest of the slides. So that's taught you about um, ASCII code. So the idea is basically when you talk to a, uh, a computer, you need to talk to an ASCII code <laughs> rather than characters. So um, this is a bit of a silly question, but what did all computers in, the, in this lecture not have? So the answer is good displays. Okay, so who's got that DSP board? Where's the green DSP board? Yeah, so look at that display on it, which is there. How, how, many, how many characters do you think you can get on that? across? 10 by what, 2? So it's a rubbish display. And the thing is, most computers you're going to be programming will have rubbish displays. They're not going to have fancy displays like that there. For example, if we skip forward and we look at this flight management computer of a 737, so this computer basically controls where the aircraft goes and if you die or not. It's got an awful screen. It's got like a, you know, a, a, maybe a 20 by 20 dot matrix screen. Just because it's cheap and you don't need a better screen. So you, the point is, this screen can only display text. So let's go on. So, so the point is, many screens can only display text like this, just because they're cheap and you don't need a fancy screen. So you guys need to be able to control text very accurately if you're going to be able to program devices that have fairly rubbish screens which is basically all interesting computers that run interesting things like aeroplanes. So the best way, so, so far in MATLAB, we can control the output. Um, some of you have learned this already by using a semicolon. So if we go, for example, x equals 1 plus 2, MATLAB will print 3. But then if we go x equals 1 plus 2, semicolon, MATLAB won't print any outputs. So it's called suppressing the output. So semicolons stop MATLAB printing stuff out to the screen. And lots of you have had a go at that already because it's in the example sheets. So that's the most simple way you can control output and it's also the only way you can control output so far. And what we're going to do this now is sort of explore output in a little bit more depth. So one command to put text or to write text out to the screen is called disp. And you remember disp as something like display. So it's basically writing to the display. And you can use disp like this. You can go, whoops, disp brackets, se semi, uh, so quote, hello world, quote, close brackets and it'll print out hello world. Or you can go disp uh, bracket single, colo, single quote, learning how to program a computer will make me rich, single quote, close bracket, and it'll print out how to, how to program a computer will make me rich. You can also use disp to print out either text or numbers. So for example, we can make it go disp, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight disp meters per second. And it'll print out the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight, meter, eight meters per second. Um, so that's quite handy. Any questions on that? Yes? Uh, I don't know what's on the previous slides, but semicolons su suppress output. Um, because the disk command is explicitly saying print to the screen. I think if you, if you leave it off, it goes answer equals something and then goes the speed of light is. You, you can play about with it yourself, but to have, a, have a play with it in the lab that's suppressing output, not suppressing output. Um, sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. Yeah? Okay. So 
I now want to tell you about a special type of variable that can hold text. Now, lots of words in computing come from like the 1960s, and it's not always sort of obvious what their meaning is. But anyway, string is a special computer word for a variable that holds text. So, for example, you can write message, which is the variable, equals single quote, the speed of light is single quote, or name equals single quote, rod, sing, single quote, or day of the week equals single quote, Monday, single quote, or name of university equals single quote, not him, single quote. So these are just variables that can hold text. Um, and all you need to remember is to put a single quote at the end, and you're good to go. And these are called strings. Can you... Thanks. Um, and what we can do is we can mix variables that hold text and the disp command. So what we can do is we can go message, the speed of light is, speed of light equals 3 times 10 to the 8. So this is actually holding a number, units equals meters per second. So we actually store what we're going to print to the screen in variables before we print to the screen. So we, and then the result will be disp message, uh, disp speed of light, disp units. So speed of light is 3 to the 8 meters per second. What's wrong with this? What's horrible and ugly about this? What's ugly about it? Why wouldn't, would you write that in an English essay? No, why not? Yeah, there's returns every, it's horrible, right? So, <laughs> correct. So, um, we need to fix that. So, I'm now going to teach you about the sprintf command. Now, this is an incredibly powerful command, and it's really well worth learning about, and it, it pops up all the time. Um, and it not, it's not only a MATLAB command, this, this command pops up in C, C++, I think maybe Python, I'm not sure. But anyway, this sprintf command is a really useful command, and it always basically enables you to control text output very, very accurately. Okay? So imagine we wanted this printed on all, imagine we wanted this printed on one line. What we'd use is we'd use the sprintf command, and this is how it works. You go sprintf, open bracket, single quote, the speed of light is percent f meters per second, single quote, then 3 times 10 to the 8. Now, what this percent %f is, is it's called a format specifier. And what it does, what the sprintf command go, does, is it reads this line, and it goes, the speed of light is percent %f, and it goes, oh, percent %f. That means I should put a number in there, and then it looks at the end, and it goes, oh, there's 3 to the 8. Put 3 to the 8 there, then carry on printing out meters per second. So the result is, answer, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So with this sprintf command, it always replaces this format specifier with whatever is at the end of the line. <clears throat> so here's another example. For example, S print F, I have percent F pounds, uh, and with 100 at the end. So what this S print F command will do is it'll go, I have percent F, oh, percent F, go to the end, find the 100, put the 100 there, pounds, comma, 100. And the answer will be, I have 100 pounds. Any questions about that? Ah, because um, that will become apparent very soon. You're, that's a good question, but this can not only be a number, this can also be a variable. So it can pop the variable in there. Okay, any other questions? Good, okay. Um, so here's a more complex example. So, ah, yeah, go for it. What, without, oh, just percent F? without any text. Yeah. It would still just replace the percent %f with a number. So the question is, what would happen if there's no text there and we just put percent %f? It would go, oh, percent %f. Yeah, I mean, like, what if you just wanted to display percent %f for the input and number? Ah. Oh, no, if you just put percent %f with no number, or if you just wanted to display percent %f? Uh, so the, the, the gentleman's question is a subtle one. He's saying, what if I want to print percent %f? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So it's a good question. Thank you. And it, it'll come clear in two slides. OK. So we can actually use percent, uh, we can use uh, sprintf to print quite complex things. So imagine we're, we're writing um, a program to, to print how much fuel is left and what speed you are and what altitude you're at in an aeroplane. We could go sprintf, speed equals percent %f meters per second, Fuel left equals percent F litres. Altitude equals percent F metres. And we can actually put multiple numbers at the end. We can put 500, 5,000, 1 to 4. And what it goes is it goes, oh, speed equals percent F. Oh, percent F. Get the number from the end, put it in. Then it goes metres per second left, 
Oh, percent F. Get the next number from the end, put it in. Latitude equal, altitude equals percent F. Or get the next number from the end, put it in. And the result is speed equals 500, means per second fuel left equals 5,000, altitude equals 10,000. So we actually build up quite complicated um, text expressions using this S, um, S print F. Now, it gets a bit, more, a bit more powerful now. What we can do is we can tr control how many decimal places it, it prints out. And sometimes this is very important. So, for example, we can go, the value of pi is percent F dot 10 F. So this dot 10f before the f means 10 decimal places. So we'll then get pi to 10 decimal places. Or we can use this dot, then number, to, con to control the number of decimal places exactly. So for example, if we go, the speed of light is percent dot 5f, then it will go, oh, pi, print that to five decimal places, read along, percent dot 10f, get pi, pop it in, print to 10 decimal places. So we can control exactly how many decimal places we, we print out just by putting a dot number in between the percent and the f. Any questions about that? Yeah, so it'll become obvious when you have a little play with it in the lab. So there's all different, so I've only covered percent f here, uh, percent f, but there's lots of different types of format specifiers. So percent f means basically a number with a decimal place. There's also e, that means scientific notation, so it looks like that. There's also D, which means decimal, so a number without a decimal place. Percent S, which is a string, which we talked about a little bit earlier, so we could print hello. Or C is a single character. There's some, there's some uh, I know it's a little bit, a lot, quite a lot to take on board, um, but it'll become quite clear once you have to play with it in the lab. Now we can like mix variables that contain numbers and text with the percent with the sprintf command. So for example, we can go name equals rod, so that's the string, number equals nine, then we can go sprintf, my name is percent s, name, I live at house number percent d, uh, number. So the result will be, my name is rod, I live at number nine. And what you can see here, which is actually very useful, is the out we're actually storing the output of sprintf in another variable. So you can actually store the output of sprintf in another variable. So it's like a way to build big variables of text with very, very sort of complex inputs and, and format it exactly how you'd want. And then we use the disp command to display A. Any questions about that? No? OK. Right, and this answers your question there. Um, how do I print percent F or, or, um, or sort of special characters they're called? Well, there's a whole series of special characters. Um, and what we use, what we, when we want to do something special, we use the, this slash, this slash is sort of like that. Um, so slash N means new line, slash T means tab, slash slash means, tab, means slash, and slash single quote, single quote means a single quote, and slash percent gets you a percent, yeah? So now we can print out anything. So that's all the new stuff I want to teach you about sprintf. So now we can make our computer print, print poems because we can do all the text, all, all the text um, alike, all the text uh, arrangement for it. So here's this poem. Oh, this shiny new computer, that ain't, that ain't just nothing cuter. It knows everything the world ever knew. And with this great computer, I don't need no writing tutor because there ain't a single thing it can't do. And we'd print this out with the sprintf command like this. Oh, this shiny new computer, new line, there just isn't single quote there, so single quote, uh, isn't nothing, single quote, cuter, new line, um, then again, new line, single quote, single quote, new line, single quote. So we control the output very, very accurately. And this is a little bit of a silly example, um, but you can imagine if you're right, like making, trying to control one of those little displays, this could be very handy to print out output in a very, very accurate way. And you can have a go at this later. So now the final thing I'm going to do is reading text on the keyboard. And this is really just one command. Okay, can you only guess what the command is? Just randomly. No? The command is called input, to get input from the keyboard. So everything's got a keyboard. Um, that, DS, that DSP board I, I was handing around, where is it now? Where's the DSP board? Where's the green? Yeah, that's got a, sh a shoddy little keyboard on it there. Um, it's like got five keys or something. 
ATMs have keyboards, PCs have keyboards, flight management systems have keyboards. You need to get input from a keyboard. So if you wanted to get MATLAB to print how much fuel is needed, question mark, you would use the input command, and you'd go answer equals input. Now the question, open bracket, single quote, how much fuel is needed, question mark, single quote, and what it would do is it would literally ask you for that input from the keyboard and store the result in answer. This is the last thing, or last new thing I want to teach you today, really. Oh, no, not yet. So, for example, you could go, if we were writing a little script to evaluate a program, input, what value of x do you want to solve the equation for? It would then ask you, to, the computer would ask you to put in a number. It would then set that number equal to x, and then you could evaluate the equation and use disp to print out the answer. So you go, what value of x do you want to solve the equation for? And then you put in 2.7279, and it will give you the answer. And there's another silly example of using sprintf and the input command together. The final thing I want to tell you is, no, the penultimate thing I want to tell you is if you want to get text from the input command, all you need to do is put a single quote s, single quote at the end. And basically, this will get text rather than a number. And the last tip, this is actually the last tip now, the last tip is strings that are variables that contain text are just arrays, OK? And you can, all these tricks I've taught you to work on arrays, like, for example, um, reading, a, reading a single character, manipulating, manipulating arrays, they all work with strings. So for example, we could say a equals my name is Rod, then if we just wanted to print out the second element of this string, so 1, 2, uh, yeah, 1, 2, which is y, we just go a brackets 2, and it says answer equals y. So you can get data out of strings very easily. And then if you want to manipulate the string, it just works like a normal array. So if we replace the 14th element with a b, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, of course, space is also an element in the array, because it's the number 32. So we go a brackets 14 equals b, and it will and print out what the result is. It will go, my name is Rob, because it's replaced the rod with Rob. So that's it. Are there any questions? No? So I do recommend that now you go, you go and have a go at this example sheet that's on the back of here, and spend just an hour on it.